No, I just, I don't think this is going to last. I think we're in a period of that we're going to look back on uh, with a lot of regret and a lot of questions and uh, because our health system's not going to be able to support it, our ecological systems, our biological systems are not going to be able to support it. And there's going to be a general reckoning. I just think a lot of that reckoning is going to come from the pleasure of eating. I really do. Welcome to the Real Organic Podcast. I'm Lindley Dixon, the co-director of the Real Organic Project. We are a grassroots, farmer-led movement with an add-on organic food label to distinguish soil-grown crops and pasture-raised livestock under the organic seal. You just heard from chef and author Dan Barber, whose restaurants include Blue Hill at Stone Barns and Blue Hill in New York City. He has celebrated for his book, The Third Plate, Field Notes on the Future of Food. In this interview, Dan Barber and Dave Chapman are joined by organic farmer and author Elliot Coleman, who all sat down together last summer for a conversation at Stone Barn Center for Agriculture before sharing a meal at Blue Hill. What a pleasure to hear these three speak together on the future of food. Welcome to the Real Organic Podcast. And uh, today we have the privilege of talking to Dan Barber and Elliot Coleman. And... Um, you two have known each other for a long time, and Elliot's the reason I'm cooking. That's right. Did you know that? Tell me. Elliot's the reason I'm cooking. Did you know that? I think you did know that. In college, I, I, I used to go to the library to avoid doing any work. I mean, I, I was the terrible student, and I just read in the library, and and I was just lucky, and I was I was interested in, I was always interested in farming, but I. I was interested in environment, farming, science, and I was always in that section of the library. And there was Elliot's book uh, lying on the shelf. I remember grabbing it, and I just, I just fell in. And uh, it's like yesterday. I remember I was 20 years old, 21 years old, and I was starting to think about what do you do after college. I didn't know anything, and uh, I, I was already cooking a little bit, but I had a real interest in farming and then I saw it right in that book. I was like, there it is. It's the, it's, I could be a Northeastern chef that was devoted to Northeastern uh, uh, produce four months of the year, four, four seasons of the year. And I, I just, the, the idea was so radical uh, and so exciting. And I remember reading that like it was the Bible. I think it's one of the first books I ever took out of my library at, at college. Uh, and took it back to my dorm room. And uh, that's what, that was my trajectory because I started to have a dream of having a greenhouse uh, on, at Blue Hill Farm, which is the family farm, and supplying this restaurant that I had in my mind uh, for the Four Seasons. And you know, back then this is, now this idea is so, so what do you call it? Uh, people are doing it everywhere in cold weather climates. Back then that was just, it was, it was nuts, nuts. And it just got me very, it got me thrilled with the idea. And it sort of gave me the, the energy and loaded my tank with this kind of fuel that, uh, that I started cooking after college and, and followed this idea of local vegetables. To a certain extent, I started to add on grains after it, but it was just this locality that was, was this central, centrifugal force of an idea that really got me. And then I'm here with David Rockefeller, you know, many years later. And the first call I made was to Elliot. Uh, I wrote you out of the blue. And it was an excuse, because I was like, finally, I have an excuse to write the man. You'd, I mean, never, if, if, you'd never spoken oh, to him. Oh, never. I would never. I was <laughs> very shy. I would never <laughs> write him. You know. But, but everything he wrote I, and every interview he did, I knew at that point. And then when Mr. Rockford came along and said to my brother and I, you know, I'm interested in this, this farm restaurant idea, I said, well, here is the dream that could come true. Uh, and I wrote a, just a, a letter to Elliot thinking he'll never respond, but if I don't do it, I'll regret it for the rest of my life. And you responded right away. And, yeah. uh, and here we are now, 20 years later. That was 20 years ago uh, because we're, two, we're 2021, and that was uh, 2000, and 2000, it was 21 years ago. So, all right, so that's a kind of amazing example of uh, ideas spreading. I know, Elliot, when you started farming, there were very few models for you to follow. You were, you were kind of trailblazing. 
there, there, were, there were models from the past. There were models from around the world. But in, in America at that time, you, you didn't have anybody no, you could go talk to. Uh, not many, because here, uh, farming had moved to California uh, quite a while ago, or at least in people's mind, because uh, it was so easy to do out there. You had moved to California. No, I, I, I said, uh, in people's minds, the source of po food had moved yeah. to California. Yeah. And so nobody thought about uh, New England feeding the world anymore. And when we started our small farm, uh, you know, we were a typical uh, six month season, summer season. But then the more you thought about, this is great, the, the quality of our food is fantastic. Uh, I take great joy in doing this, but we got to figure out how to make a living at it. And that w was what led us into trying to expand the season. And so we, were, we worked and we could go longer into the fall and we could start sooner in the spring and longer into the fall and sooner. And suddenly, voila, the end of winter. And people had tried to do it in greenhouses, heating the greenhouses. But it turned out that the key to, that made that difficult was the short days in the winter. And what we learned was if the crops that we expected to yield food in the winter were planted soon enough that they had a good root system, then they would keep turning out new leaves even in the short day season. But if we planted seeds during the short day season, they took forever to germinate and forever before they uh, uh, did anything. And the key was the 10 hour day. Once day length dropped below 10 hours, you had to have established plants like spinach and planted maybe uh, at least uh, 45 days before that point. And then it would turn out new leaves all winter long, no matter how cold it was, provided we had it in a greenhouse with a second layer of protection over it. Each layer of protection moved it 500 miles to the south on the east coast. And so under two layers, our spinach was in Georgia. It produced prodigiously all winter long. And then we just kept experimenting around. And the Asian greens were great because they're both cold hardy and uh, and don't mind heat. And we just kept expanding our offerings. We kept trying everything. One of the things that made our farm uh, almost famous was we would plant carrots the middle of August. And then once it started to get really cold, we would move one of our moving greenhouses over them. And if you leave them with their roots in the ground in the cold weather, they become so sweet that these became known as candy carrots in our local market. And uh, discovery after discovery, it turned out that farming in the East and producing all four seasons was not difficult at all and slightly challenging. But the flavors we were getting from it, this was the best. See, that's the kind of thing you get from a farmer that, from Elliot, that you don't get from a lot of farmers is that the pursuit of the flavor because at its heart, what made Eliot's reading to me so interesting was that he spoke and wrote like a chef. Uh, and that, that what he's describing in these cold, hardy winter vegetables and greens and everything else is really about converting starches to sugars and making food sing in a way that most regions of this country anyway can't produce. So not only is it, not only is it not that difficult to farm the Four Seasons. It's demonstrably better uh, from a chef's perspective because you're, you're locked into the kind of flavors that you can't get uh, from most regions. So it ended up being a, not just a, a, a test of the ability to farm in cold weather. It became a real superpower for me. So. Yeah. But I have an equal appreciation of what Dan does as a chef because I tell people, Dan is able to take something that I thought was spectacular when I harvested it, but after he does his slate treatment on it, it's even better. And that was just amazing. The, the subtlety and, uh, and uh, ingeniousness of his uh, cooking. 
Yeah, well, the whole, the whole creation of farm to table, of uh, appreciating the superior qualities of good food, and gives the chef uh, an amazing, amazing different platform to start with. And yeah, a, a lot well, of what you're doing. It's a magic ingredient. Yeah. yeah, the magic ingredient is finding that good food. Yeah, once you do, you'll, I mean, chefs are pit bulls, you know. When they find something that tastes better, it makes them look like a better chef. Yeah, that's like catnip. Yeah. So I want to go back even earlier because I, I, I was, I knew you, I was with you, Elliot, when you were uh, discovering Four Season Farming and going to France and looking at people who are at the same latitude. It was, it was uh, really exciting to see the development of that thought. But, but 20 years earlier, you were discovering organic farming. And, you know, without necessarily with season extension, we all did what we could, but, but the, it was a fundamentally different way of farming. And at the time, it was, uh, there were so few models of it, so few examples of it in our world, in our country. What was it like at that time? Because I think just as, as the chefs were really inventing a new cuisine by going back to a very traditional cuisine, you were, you were reinventing a very traditional kind of farming by celebrating it. Yeah, well, I, I wasn't reinventing it. I was uh, reading old books, and because there were some of the early people to get into uh, non-chemical food production were brilliant, and they wrote great books about it. But what truly drew me in was how well it worked. It was just... And I, I used to say that the joy was every day I got to commune with the secrets of the universe because the reason you didn't need poisons or pesticides was because you had learned to understand the needs of the plant and that was how the soil was prepared and all of these things. And it was a whole uh, collection of miracles together that worked. And the reason it had never been uh, taken advantage of is if I do organic farming correctly, I'm not buying anything. I'm creating all my fertility with uh, green manures, cover crops, crop rotations, and things like that. These are all management practices. And uh, uh, there's nothing to sell to a farmer who learns to take advantage of what the natural world will do for you if you learn to work with it. And so there was no motivation for any uh, industry to mention or, or push this idea because there's nothing to sell to the farmer who learned to do it that way. I'm amazed by the power of that profit motive that um, because there is something to sell with industrial agriculture, there's a lot to sell. In fact, everything. <laughs> I'm, I'm amazed at how that can um, push out uh, a kind of farming in which we grow our fertility, in which the cycles are embraced. Do you have that experience? So your, your restaurants are quite different from McDonald's. Um, Thank goodness. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. I appreciate that. Absolutely. But, but McDonald's is um, a defining feature of America and it's spreading over the world. And it appears to be almost unstoppable. I don't buy that. Do you? Okay. Do you? Well, come on. I don't you either. <laughs> Tell me. Well, it's not unstoppable. It's 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 a Ferris wheel. It's here. It's actually on its. Look at look at young people today. They're not turning to McDonald's. That's not right. You agree with that? No. And uh, the nice thing is uh, a lot of the young people who come to work f for us on the farm are also interested in cooking. Uh, when I was a young guy, I remember I, I got out of college, went to graduate school, and all of a sudden I had to feed myself. I mean, I barely knew how to boil water. Uh, we were so ignorant back then. And now the young people today, they have been inspired uh, not just to want to farm, but to want to cook and make great food by people like Dan. So well, for food's the currency. And so what these young people talk about it, McDonald's is... Saying that McDonald's the future is like saying we were looking at a 
factory right here billowing black smoke. And I said to you, that's the future of industry. <laughs> say, no, it's not. That's the Industrial Revolution. That's not the future of industry. Yeah. Yeah. That's, McDonald's is just the, the idea that big agriculture and big fast food is, is indomitable and ever expanding and, and, um, and inevitable is just not true with what you see with Generation Z and and beyond. I live it every day with my 30 cooks. Uh, and it's true, it's a rarefied world, but it is amazing what they share with each other on social media. Uh, and the interest, the, the amount of young people that uh, want to know where the food is coming from, what the story is, uh, how it's grown, it, it is just exploded. So we need these people to grow up and have children. <laughs> and once they become parents, this will be an X factor. So I, I'm actually pretty bullish on the future of food. Uh, I may be, that, may, that may set me apart because I don't know a lot of people who feel uh, excited about the future. But if you hang out with enough young people, you start to see what's happening and, and what's coming. And in that sense, big food is, is history. It's done. It's old news, actually. And it, if you go back to even younger people, um, those carrots I mentioned that we slide the greenhouse over. Um, what so surprised people uh, in the market where we sell was that our carrots became the trading item of choice in local grade school lunch boxes. Their children would ask them to go to the food co-op or wherever our stuff was being sold. And so this was where the farmer took the first step before the chef by growing food in such a way that it optimized its flavor. And that was, that was a totally new thing. And so these same parents would later tell us, well, our children like your spinach. They've never eaten spinach before. Well, it turned out that the way we were uh, making our compost and, and growing the spinach, I believe it was because it, it got more calcium into it and the calcium uh, mellowed out the taste of spinach. There was none of that bitter aftertaste. The, and the same, oxalic acids, right? Yeah, so you the me same. That. But uh, these were all things where uh, the partnership uh, was wonderful because if we did our job right as farmers, then Dan's uh, magic in taking it the next step uh, made it even better. Okay. I so want to believe what you're saying. And I do believe that good food is real, that real organic farming is real, that it all works. At the same time, I see real organic farmers being driven out of business. And let's start with Horizon. Horizon is the major brand for organic milk in America, owned by Danone. And they just announced that 89 farms are being dropped in a year. And those farms face likely bankruptcy. I, I would say 10 of them are gonna get picked up by Stonyfield, maybe a few by Organic Valley, and the rest probably won't get picked up by anybody. And they're probably done. And they're good farms, 47 of them here in New York, you know, a bunch in Vermont, a bunch in Maine, 20% of the farms in dairy, organic dairy farms in Maine. So, what do we make of that? I, I guess my first question is, do you think that, that um, it's okay what Danone is doing? Is that just business? If, if you make buggy whips, you have to expect to go out of business? Yeah, I mean, you know, we could blame the corporation and yeah. I, I'm not into that. It yeah. doesn't really last as <laughs> too long, you know? It's like, what, what is the point? Uh, yeah, we all would think they'd have a, more of a, a responsibility to these farmers and to the region for sure. But they're, you know, often they're not in control of what they're doing. It's their board, it's their investors. It's, it's so it's a complicated calculus. I'm more interested in the eating culture because that's what I think I, that's my job. I mean, it's really a failing of me. I should be, we, the chef community, should be creating a culture around dairies that is much more than just the milk. Because that is the lesson of, of supporting a dairy culture. It's, it's not about the milk. 
It's about the veal calves uh, because 50% of everything that's born on a dairy is male. Right now, we have a culture that takes that male calf and kills it. Uh, it's, most dairies don't even pay for it to be removed from the farm because it's too, they only can make the money on that. They don't want a day of wasted milk because the margins are so thin that a male is born, it's the last thing you want to see and it's booted off the farm, really it goes in the compost pile. Uh, but what if we had a culture like the French, for instance, a dairy culture that prized veal, uh, that raised young beef uh, in a particular way that, yes, siphoned off some milk, but had such great value at the end of the day that the food culture supported, as in coveted veal, uh, that was quite profitable. Uh, and that, not only humane, but because you, this is, we're not talking about veal that's created, we're not talking about white veal, we're talking about real pasture veal. So it drinks its milk, but it produces this unbelievably delicious, versatile, healthy meat uh, that should have a higher price. And if a food culture supported it, coveted it, uh, it would create an economy for a farmer uh, that would more than offset the lost milk from the veal. Well, then on the other end, you should be supporting old dairy cows because at the end of a dairy cow's life, you have one of the great meats of the world. You have a, uh, a cow that uh, produced uh, hundreds and in cases of Blue Hill Farm, tens of thousands of gallons of milk over nine, 10, 11. We just slaughtered a, a 12 year old cow that was, that was uh, done producing milk. And we, have her, we had her meat in the kitchen and it was just, we paid a lot for that cow. Uh, and we got some of the most incredible, incredibly delicious beta carotene rich fat off of that animal. Uh, and that's another economy for the, for the farm. And we should encourage dairies to be raising pigs because dairies have high somatic cell counts and a lot of that milk gets wasted and we, the farmer doesn't get any money for it. Well, what if that high somatic cell count, instead of being uh, uh, thrown, in the, thrown in the sewer or in the gutter, uh, is fed to pigs as a, as a credible protein source for pigs? Well, all of a sudden you get a free pig. Uh, that the farmer's selling to a restaurant or to a, to a, to a regional food co-op. Uh, so that, if you take veal and you take retired dairy cows and you take a pig economy, and don't get me started on goats and chickens, but if you were to, if you were to support really a regional food economy, you'd be supporting everything beyond the milk. And that's where the richness of, I think you would agree, a food culture really emerges. And it's the job of the chef to create that culture. So in many ways, I would point less to Danone and more to the chef, because the chef is in a position of power in this weird moment that we're in, uh, to have a broadcasting voice about what people should be eating. People listen to chefs. I just read a, someone sent me a, the most, I sent it to the most fascinating um, uh, a survey uh, of 20 professions. Who do you trust the most? We were politicians, you can only guess on that continuum. But, uh, uh, and professors, by the way, and, and uh, doctors, whew, I won't even say, but chefs, number one. Chefs were the number one most trusted voices uh, of, of the top 20 professions. <laughs> That's hilarious and really telling. And so our job as chefs is to broadcast a message about what people should be eating. They're clamoring for that, clamoring for help uh, in deciding how to feed themselves, their community, their friends, their children. And so we need to do more of that. And we need to create that kind of food economy uh, for the dairies. And, and in that sense, they won't be as dependent on these, uh, on these corporations that are dependent on the bottom line. Elliot? No, that was Elliot. eloquent, Dan. I was going to say, uh, the thing I like about chefs like Dan is they're passionate about what they do. And what Wait till you, you get, taste this veal tonight. You'll know why I'm passionate. What you get with good farmers is that they're passionate about what they do. In other words, they're getting their life satisfaction from doing work that they find meaningful. And the problem uh, that you have that creates uh, the other world are people whose only life reward is getting the paycheck at the end of the week. And the people who are turning out exceptional products are the people whose life reward is the f good feeling they have from turning out a truly exceptional product. 
And that's what is missing as uh, uh, the honest organic gets uh, uh, done in by uh, 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 the uh, less honest organic is you don't have enough passionate people who are willing uh, to put their heart and soul into making something absolutely exceptional. If you do that, uh, the quality of that food is, is uh, immeasurably improved because the passionate person is looking at all of the factors that are involved. You know, I'd like to think that the COVID is a changing, change moment. I think everyone wants to think that, but for the, for the food culture, because there really is a connection between COVID health, food. And I, it seems to me if there's never been an opportunity more distinct than right now to understand that what we eat really affects our ability to, uh, to ward off infection and disease. Um, and probably never been a moment that, that's, that's been as clear as this. And I would hope, I would think uh, that that's an opportunity for people to, to change their ways about food. Um, so we'll, we'll see as we come out of this. Well, more we're... and more studies showing the connection between how we eat and, and death from COVID. I mean, it's very clear. Yeah. Yeah. We, tell me. Actually, well, I I, what I, well, yeah. Well, the latest study I just read out of uh, England is 94% uh, of COVID cases, death by COVID, uh, is underlying conditions, 94%. And of the 94%, 92%, it's almost 100% of those are one of three categories. It's either diabetes, hypertension, or obesity, and often comorbidities, you know, the three of them. But they're all food-related diseases. I mean, they all are. Uh, diabetes, I mean, it's, I, I, I was on the phone with a Rockefeller scientist last week. Rockefeller scientist said to me, if you just isolate, because I said this quote, he said, yeah, no, we've been looking at that. It's staggering. More and more studies are coming out of it. I said, if you look at diabetes alone in the US, just to, to try and single out one, and of course you can't because they're generally mixed, but if you just single out diabetes, if, diabe if, if COVID had hit in 1975 the way it hit in 2020, the rate of diabetes was so much lower in 1975 that COVID would have been a very bad flu season, period. It's this incredible statistic. That, so, and, and we're talking about adult set uh, diabetes, right? Type two, and that's all food related. So I think as we, as we get some distance from COVID, we're not out of it, as we get some distance, more and more people will come to understand that how, how they, uh, pay for their food, treat their food, their, how their food is treated, has a direct result on their health. We all know that intuitively, but I think this example will become uh, a game changer, I'm hoping. If the rises in percentage of the population that are either diabetic, pre-diabetic, or obese, uh, if we were paying attention to it and noticed the rise since what every year you were saying, uh, you know, it had been much less. This would be, holy cow, what is going on? Right. Uh, this would be like air quality had suddenly diminished right. or the water quality. Right. But th for some reason, these are just allowed to continue getting worse and worse every year without anybody even noticing it. There the occasional mention in the press. But wow, these are... Uh, Major it's a very good changes. compared to air quality, like acid rain. You know, we did something about acid rain yeah. uh, in the '70s. You know, when it became this alarming thing. I don't understand how this these statistics, when they come out, won't be as alarming. Okay, so what we did yeah. is we changed the laws. Yeah. We changed the regulations that ruled industry. Do you believe that we need to do that around food and agriculture? Yeah. What's your feeling on that? Would you go towards laws or would you go towards culture? If the Food and Drug Administration did the job that it was designed to do and banned uh, the creation of foods that are making people ill, and it's very easy to figure out what these are, 
especially you know the ones that are filled with artificial flavors. The old uh, saying, "Oh, these are so good you can't eat only one." Uh, these are destructive foods, and the Food and Drug Administration should be uh, uh, legislating against foods like that because they are harming the population. Dan, do you agree with that? I don't know. I'm a little less, a little less uh, positive about government. You know, I sometimes I in this climate with these, you know, you just look at the masker debate. That it's a debate. It's just it's well, just, better you know, Dan yeah. that we're educating people. Yeah. So they're aware of this and are making the decision themselves. Yeah, I like to go at it through. Uh, through the pleasure principle, you know, but, that this is yeah, a hedonistic but, endeavor. Yeah. Uh, it seems like we, there are no more virtue doesn't get very far. There are no more uh, classes in, in home ec in that's right. schools anymore. Right. Nobody's taught to. The dissemination of information. That's why I said it's yeah. the chef's responsibility now. We yeah. are the new home ec, yeah. you know, in some ways. We're followed and, and, and listened to in that context. So. Well, we can only have government change if there is a social movement to change, and that can only happen through education. And I think you are both educators. As much as you're a farmer, as much as you're a chef, you are both educators. You became a chef because of his education yeah. of a book from a yeah. person you had never met. And I was here yesterday watching the amazing educational uh, effort that you're making. Everything here. that grew out of it is from that moment when I grabbed that book. I always think, what if I hadn't gone to the library that night to not study, which is what I did, or what <laughs> I had not gone and seen the book on the stack? I really think that. Right. But I also think that this education, one of the things that ultimately we must do if this is going to change, I don't believe that the wave of obesity and diabetes is just because modern Americans are weak and 30 years ago, we were so much stronger. Oh no, but, but what's put into the food is what makes it addictive. Up and down the uh, Jersey Turnpike, there are hundreds of companies involved in flavorings, in trying to find ways to fool people's uh, taste buds. He's picking out the Jersey Turnpike because New Jersey was the Garden State. Yes. It's particularly <laughs> offensive that the Garden State has been paved over yeah. <laughs> and been replaced by food replacement, actually, yeah. right. which, is, which is the real irony, and it's not a nice one. It's yeah. not a delicious one. How about that? Yeah. Okay, so, so Dan, you, you favor the, the pleasure principle of reminding people of yeah, how good yeah. food can yeah. taste. Otherwise, it's pedantic, and people go in the other direction. You know, I get told, if people are rallying against being told to wear a mask, Imagine the rallying against for people being told what they should eat for dinner. I mean, you didn't want your mother doing that, you know? You don't want the government doing it. But not I, in this day and age. Dan, chef, I'm not man, telling them man. what they can and can't eat for dinner. I'm suggesting that when the additives that are being put into food are creating situations where people are being poorly nourished, that is where uh, the government could uh, have some effect. What's the example of that? Well, the, you know, the Dorito effect, I suspect. Yeah. Uh, uh, th that was the b first popular book that pointed out uh, where a lot of that effect is, is coming from. And uh, uh, again, but we don't seem to notice how much this is going on. Uh, we stop for and you uh, think that's the power of the industry to, to oh my gosh yeah. yes yeah, yeah. Uh, but we stopped for breakfast on the way uh, down here yesterday and uh, it was a diner when you walked into the diner the first thing you saw was a 30 or 40 foot long uh, glass fronted case filled with pastries filled with you know there was yellow ones and red ones and every dye imaginable and and it was just frightening <laughs> <laughs> because every single person uh, eating yeah. in there yeah. was obese. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, you, you, someone could have come and filmed that and said, look, this is what happens. You walk into this diner, and this is what you're faced with. Uh, 
Wow, I mean, that was, at that point, I, I turned to Barbara and I said, okay, there's no hope. <laughs> there's really no hope. Okay, so Dan, you have hope. <laughs> tell, tell me what you're laughing about, what Elliot's saying. No, I mean, he's, he's skewing to, it's so funny. No, no, I just, I don't think this is going to last. I think we're in a period of, that we're going to look back on uh, with a lot of regret and a lot of questions and uh, because our health system's not going to be able to support it, our ecological systems, our biological systems are not going to be able to support it, and there's going to be a general reckoning. I just think a lot of that reckoning is going to come from the pleasure of eating. I really do. The, the massive amount of people that have chosen to change their life in light of COVID, stunning all the economists. Nobody predicted this. They took people off the, 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 the payroll of the government, and they expected this mad dash back to work. They're, finding that people don't want to go back to their jobs. They want a more fulfilling life because they've had a taste of what it might be like. I think yeah. that's a good analogy yeah. to what's possible with food. You get a taste for it, you don't go back, you know? It's like, you, you just, you don't, you don't feel, it's like the gay marriage laws. It's not like we're going back to like, you know, repealing gay marriage laws, you know? Once Americans uh, both have an appreciation and understanding and education, uh, for things that are right. I do feel like these things tend to, to happen and happen with dizzying speed. You know what, I'll tell you the other reason that makes me happy is that we've been lamenting the American food culture. One of the great things about Americans is how fast we adopt new ideas and new trends. It's, it's just amazing. You know, look at kale, look at Greek yogurt, look at sushi, look at these things that like overnight became American food. Uh, that doesn't happen anywhere. Nowhere in the world do they adopt new food ideas because they have good food culture, actually. They still are tethered to something in their past. It's who they are. We don't have any of that. Our history is, our history is actually a history of bad food culture. And you know, one of the positives of that is that when we see something, when we get to something that is good and tastes good and makes us happy, we adopt it. And we figure out a way to pay more for it, which is so interesting. People always talk about how people never pay more for food, you know. But when something is good and, and has an argument that's, that is persuasive and is delicious, people figure out a way. In the same way that people figured out a way to pay for a cell phone every month. You know, if we had been sitting here in 1981, what was that, 30, that was 40 years, no, 30 years ago. 30 years, that's 30 years ago? Jesus, that's, no, that's it's 40, 40 years, years ago. ago. 40 years ago, if we had been sitting here and I had said to you that in 2021, People are going to figure out a way to pay for this thing called an iPhone. You guys would have laughed. No one's going to have a budget of $120 a month to, to pay. And I would say, hey, you know what? That's going to be on top of a, a TV bill. That's going to be a hundred, yep. another hundred dollars. <laughs> so you, you think it's going to be an extra $250 of disposable income for every, for 90% penetration of Americans? They're, they're, they're has the money. They, they're living paycheck to paycheck. Well, the culture shifted in a way that cable TV became indispensable and an iPhone became indispensable. We need food to become indispensable. I don't think laws are the way to go about doing that. I think the culture has to demand it. Pleasure, pleasure, be an army of pleasure. And that, and that is what Americans are good at, and we will adopt it quickly. So that's, my, that's, that's why I'm positive for the future. But you tell me why you're not. Now you can convince me. Well, I was going to say one thing about uh, uh, what people eat. When Barbara and I took a trip across the 44th parallel, which is where we are in Maine, yeah. uh, across Europe, uh, one January, to see what the Europeans with the same day length we have yeah. were eating. And I remember we, we used to stop whenever we saw gardens or community garden, and we stopped this one, and this old guy was the most enthusiastic. He had a beret on, he, just everything you expect. And he garden was magnificent. This is the middle of January. And I said, well, one thing I expected to see and I don't see are all the, the small greens for a mesclun salad. And he said, but that's not my traditional salad. He was growing endive and escarole because those were his traditional salad and he had the little caps over them to blanch the hearts yeah, and yeah, everything. Yeah. And, it, and we said, well, gee, in America, those French salads, he said, yeah, they're from the south of France. <laughs> those have become the latest hot thing. He said, but they aren't my traditional salads. Yeah, it's nice. Oh. All right, I see that they're Tugging it. Well, your... We're gonna have two. One last question. I want to end on a. That was a pretty positive note. I mean, I believe. I believe that. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. The 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 empire of of um, 
Pleasure. I have a question here about moving on from organic, and it was a suggestion in my interview with Michael Pollan that, that it was time maybe to move on from organic because organic didn't take into account, didn't, wasn't aware when it was created as a movement of climate change. And I'm just curious, do you think What's that, the argument? How do you move on? What, what's the prescription? Well, he believed that regenerative agriculture would, this is a, a kind of a big question, but he, he thought that the principles of regenerative agriculture of no-till were going to sequester vastly more carbon than- Oh shit, the, I bet that lit you up. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a lie. Uh, the no-till people uh, love to pursue this. But first you have to look at where all the no-till uh, scientific research came from. It came from the companies who were producing herbicides. They were the ones who were trying to convince farmers, hey, this no-till is, is a good idea. And I have uh, copies in my files of studies, one down, done in, uh, uh, down in near DC by the USDA themselves one done out in California, and they both determined that regular old organic farming puts more carbon in the soil than no-till. And if you think about it, regular so hang old- on, Hang on, just so the, the, because this is gonna be for the regular public too, you gotta to explain that. When you, you're saying regular old farm, you're saying you believe in the plow okay. if it's used okay. correctly, right? Well, no, so you gotta, no, you gotta, no not, not the plow. Uh, the plow wasn't a good, tool, but mixing organic matter into the surface of the soil, which is what uh, Edward Faulkner, who wrote Plowman's Folly, yeah. he was only against turning the furrow over and burying the organic matter down in an airless layer on the bottom. He was in favor of mixing organic matter into the soil, where as it decomposed, it gave off CO2. Oh, CO2 is bad. No, CO2 isn't bad. CO2 in the soil mixes with water to create carbonic acid, which is able to etch minerals out of the soil particles that are then available for the plants. This has been how agriculture has worked all these years. And the no-till uh, religious fanatics are trying to pretend that organic farming never did this. Organic farming has been doing this since it started. And the uh, uh, big Midwestern no-till guys, they wouldn't have even known about cover crops or green manures if organic farming hadn't kept those concepts alive for the last hundred years. Organic farming has been doing everything that the regenerative I'm still, people- I, This is so interesting, but I'm still trying to tease out the difference. I don't get, what, what is Michael lamenting about organic that's not- Well, he, would, he has been taken in by the idea that the way organic has been being run is not sequestering carbon. And the, somehow everybody decided sequestering carbon was the only role of agriculture. I actually used to think the role of agriculture was to produce food for people to eat. <laughs> but the techniques of organic <laughs> agriculture have been sequestering carbon successfully for the whole time. And the techniques of organic agriculture were the techniques that farmers have been using for hundreds of years. Green manures, cover crops, crop rotations. I can read you Roman that's what I farming I guess that's books. what I don't understand you the difference know, is. I don't want to speak for Michael. No, no, here, I don't. Forget Michael but, for a second. But, but so, what is, yeah. what well, is there the is issue? bad organic of course, agriculture, of course. which, you know, does trash the soil. And, uh, you know, we see examples of it on a large scale. But there's bad regenerative agriculture too. There's so anyway, terrible, so, yeah, right. yes, that, absolutely. So if we, I, I guess my question was, do, do you think that good organic agriculture, in fact, is the best response we have to climate change agriculturally? Definitely. And there, there are studies to prove that. But the th point I make all the time is that the people who are touting regenerative agriculture are one-time chemical farmers who degenerated their soil with chemical farming for all those years, and now they're pretending to invent, have invented something new, rather than admitting that their chemical farming for all those years was what was destroying the soil. That's great. I mean, th there is more hype around regenerative than I can believe but 
it's a very effective hype because it's done by people who are tell very me, effective at doing tell that. Tell me your definition of the difference between regenerative and organic. I think, and I'll just start by saying, I think good organic farming is always regenerative. So I'm lost. I mean, I'm sure you feel that too. I'm sure no you feel answer. that too. But the, okay, but then he what said is, it. Okay, but what is the, okay, then what is the uh, difference if you were to I ask? I would say that a lot of people believe that all tillage um, is a mistake, that it is, it is uh, not good agriculture. Most of those people aren't farmers and they don't understand, like, I don't know that many no-till vegetable farms, either conventional or organic. They're talking about large livestock operations by and large. And in that case, for organic, they're also not tilling. So it's... it's right, how do you run a, a, a mixed grain operation without without it? That's, I'm, it's a question, yeah, without tilling. It's a question indeed. Yeah, yeah. you don't, right? I, I, not that I know of. Yeah. yeah. And where it all came from, uh, the idea of cover crops. Cover crops have been around forever. It's a wonderful idea, but the chemical farmers weren't using them, and the organic farmers weren't using them necessarily. You just take chemical farming and add in a cover crop, and all of a sudden your erosion is less, and you have roots in the soil that are feeding the bacteria and all this. But those ideas were a part of original organic farming thinking. Uh, whether the farmers who claim to be organic were all doing it that well is uh, always a question. Yes. But they were part of organic farming from the start. Yeah. And when I see the statements on regenerative websites that, oh, organic is, is nothing but uh, substituting a, a, you know, something else for uh, chemical fertilizers, this is not true. Good organic farming doesn't need any inputs. It, you know, the, the wave of excitement around what is being called regenerative is, is a huge wave. And some of it is very good. What, what I am unhappy about is being used to disparage organic farming. Right. How would, you be a, how would you do grain farming or vegetable farming, for that matter, if you didn't harvest your crop, plow your field and and I mean, you could you could double plant a cover crop and a, and a grain crop, and you could take off the grain crop, right, and have the cover crop there. But ultimately, you have to seed. So what, how could you? Well, you there were uh, people in Australia I remember hearing about years ago who would uh, sow uh, clover underneath the wheat when they sow right. the wheat, and right. the wheat comes up, and then right. you have a clover field that your animals can graze. Sure. Then what? But then, <laughs> then, what? then they would have that grazed down or mowed down to nothing. And then and you direct, direct seed, sow. You direct seed. The, the, and and uh, your, if you look at a, a wheat kernel, that there's, a, that's, there's a lot of muscle in there, and that thing can grow up if the pasture has been eaten way down, it's the end of the uh, season for those uh, grasses. Right. You put in the seeds that have a lot of vigor and they're meant to grow through the winter, right. you would never have to till. And I think that could be done easier. It's harder to do uh, if you're vegetable. a vegetable grower, but we have a wonderful technique. You know what a flail mower is. It's a spinning axle with knives on it. Yeah, uh, I've seen it. On and uh, the, they come with a roller in the back that you adjust to uh, uh, how deep the, the flails are cutting down. We took the roller off the back, and so this thing will go a half inch into the soil. And if we have a field in the fall where we have harvested cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, and all those stems are yeah. sitting there and yeah. they're hard to decompose, yeah. we go over it with this modified flail mower right. and there's nothing but shredded... Uh, so green manure. Uh, there's a shredded uh, uh, stems on there. Right. And I can plant directly into that. But I asked uh, a question of all the uh, uh, no-till uh, uh, religious types. I said, is that tillage. They said, oh yeah, you're going into the soil. I said, come on, I'm like going in a half inch. How is that destroying anything? And they said, oh, well, yeah, but it really is tillage. Come on. These, these people have started a religion. This isn't science. The tillage being the part where you're cutting down the leftover plant material. They're right, saying but, that's but enough tillage, tillage is where yeah, you are it. working the soil. Yeah, I get it. And I was contending that going in a half inch was not uh, 
Uh, what do you, what do you, what's the difference for, uh, between plowing and tilling? Uh, plowing, uh, the reason Edward Faulkner wrote his book, Plowman's Folly, was as you turn that furrow, all the organic matter on the surface is being dumped into the bottom of the cut you've made, right. and then soil is on top, and it's packed in this airless right. thing where it's doing no good at all. Okay, so that's and, a plow. And, and, and he was suggesting uh, that you used a disc harrow, which just cut and mixed it into the surface. And at the time Faulkner was writing, rototillers had just started to come yeah. in, and he loved that idea. And he suggested the answer was to mix the organic matter in the top few inches of the soil, where, as I said, as it decomposes, CO2 changed to carbonic acid, and, and you are creating fertilizers on the farm. So is that tillage, or is it, is it no-till? Plowing, uh, plowing is, a, is a subset of tilling. There are all different kinds of tillage. Plowing is yeah. a more extreme. I get yeah. that. So, yeah. But tilling what, what is I'm taking, talking what's about the machine on a, on a 2,000 acre farm that's tilling? What's the, what do you call it? What, what is what, tilling? What, what I'm talking is about is what uh, many people refer to as shallow tillage or non-inversion tillage. And the plow inverts. OK, so tillage that inverts is a plow. Yes. OK. So, which, so, was a, which was a brilliant invention. Yeah. Because if you have an ox or a team of oxen and you're trying to prepare a field that's in a sod, yeah. you need something that can turn it over. Turn it over. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's hard for the ox to power a rototiller. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. A lot of things have happened since then. But, but on your field, is your field ever naked when you go into plant it? It has to be at some point. Well, yeah. If we're, we're planting carrots, yeah. small seeds. Right. But uh, they quickly come up and you have a, a, a covering. But it's, it was the fact that many people were leaving the fields uncovered over winter. And right. if you go to our farm now, there's uh, all sorts of winter cover on all the fields that come out of vegetables. Yeah, yeah, yeah. good. But religion aside, there is some really interesting research being done by farmers on no-till organic. And I've seen some of the trials. It's really interesting. It's not easy. Oof. And they're, they're saying, yeah, we're not there yet, but it's something that is really worth looking into. So I think there's wonderful stuff developing more sophistication. Tillage can be destructive. It also can be uh, how we feed ourselves. So this is what we're working, at least feed ourselves without chemicals, without an herbicide. Right, because tillage is the, is the excuse to, to, to dump uh, 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 Roundup and you kill non -tillage all the other. Yeah. Sorry, non tillage yeah. is the excuse to. But so. a lot of the the new young hotshot uh, uh, no till uh, organic vegetable growers, uh, they have a very simple answer. Yeah. They spread six inches of compost all over the farm, and they say, "See, we have fertility and we have no weeds." And that's because weeds. If they germinate more than two inches below the surface, no, they're not going to make the sun and they don't germinate. But where the heck is the world going to get yeah, yeah, six yeah, inches yeah. of compost yeah. to spread everywhere? On more than an acre or two. <laughs> um, yeah. So there's a lot of, of uh, let's say, non-thinking it through going on in a, in, a, in a lot of that. There is. But yeah. there are some really good farmers looking at it you know, uh, uh, Full Belly is working on it, experimenting with it out in California. So is Scott Park. He is not a hobby farmer. Yeah. You know? and, and they're doing serious, large scale trials. And he says, there's a lot of problems. We haven't figured it out. Um, but he's still interested. He's been interested for years in doing trials. So I think that, that things are being learned. I, I don't like to see what's happened where there's this, this the term regenerative, which is now adopted by Bear Monsanto yeah, right. and Cargill <laughs> right. and, and uh, Gen General uh, Mills, you know, and uh, McDonald's is now a regenerative company, according to them. So it, it, it's the same thing that, that has happened with organic, except there's no abiding definition beneath all the hype, whereas I think organic has a, a movement yeah. that pre-exists the industrial yeah. invasion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's well said. Yeah. You should be sitting where I'm sitting. I got to go to my... <laughs> All right. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Uh -huh.
Thank you for listening to The Real Organic Podcast. We hope that you'll subscribe, tell your friends, and leave us a rating and review. A video version of this interview, as well as the full transcript with links related to our conversation, is found at realorganicproject.org forward slash episode 58. Please join us next time when our guest is investigative nutritionist and host of Food Sleuth Radio, Melinda Hemmelgarn. To find a real organic farm near you, visit realorganicproject.org forward slash farms and see you next time.